Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Beth Hughes, as it said in the previous sl slide. I'm a curator at Arts Council Collection, and I'm speaking to you this evening from uh, South Bank Centre in London on what is turned out to be a really lovely evening. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit today about the history of Arts Council Collection, uh, choosing five works which I've chosen for a very specific reason, uh, which I'll go into in a bit in my talk. So I'm going to talk for about half an hour, um, I, the initial part of the talk will be done around six o'clock um, and then I will be answering any questions that you might put um, in, the, in the question box, the chat box is, is also open. Um, I'm going to pretend I'm some sort of technological whiz but I'm really, really not. So please forgive me if I trip up a little bit or if I don't quite get the technology smoothly as I could do. So some of you may have heard of Arts Council Collection. Uh, hopefully some of you have worked with us, um, maybe borrowed from us, uh, maybe so seen some of our artworks out and about in your local community. Um, so you may be aware of us, but some of you may not have done um, because we're not a collection with an art gallery. So we don't have that physical space that somebody could go and visit and have a look at our works. But we work with art galleries, museums, schools, libraries, all kinds of places around the country. So although you may not have definitely heard of us before, you may have seen one of our artworks um, out and about, maybe in a doctor's surgery at some point, maybe in a university building, um, as we really do aim to get everywhere. Um, so as I said, we're unique amongst public collections. Many of the ones you'll heard about in these series of talks will have buildings and the history of those buildings to tell you about. Um, and our, the way that we work is primarily in partnership, sharing the collection um, and working with people to, uh, you know, a wider range of array of audiences to enjoy and appreciate British art. Um, and our collection began in 1946 or sort of. Um, we didn't come out of nowhere as a, as a collection. There were lots of precursors to what we know today as Arts Council Collection. Um, because before there was Arts Council of Great Britain, which is today known as Arts Council England, the sort of funding body, um, there was an organisation called SEMA, uh, the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts. Not such a snappy title, but very much does what it says on the tin. Um, it was part of a wartime cultural offer, uh, which saw many artists, actors, musicians out of work during World War II. And so SEMA was um, like a counterpart to ENSA. So ENSA took a cultural offer to the front line and SEMA was about the cultural offer that was happening here in the UK. Um, but the focus of SEMA at the very beginning was very much the, what we'd call perhaps the high arts. So theater, classical music, painting and sculpture. And there was a sort of a, a, a big sway of community art projects, which perhaps weren't considered in those earlier days, which was taken in much larger by Arts Council England when it was formed. So SEMA started uh, to collect a group of paintings. My first non-seamless as I try and make the first slide come up. There we go. Okay, so um, here we have uh, an example of a still from a film SEMA put together in 1942. Um, so they started to collect a group of paintings and they were displaying them um, around the UK. So often in factories, community centres, church halls, places where people could go as museums and galleries were closed and their contents stored safely away. And there's many famous stories of where lots of our national collections were, were sort of hidden in those times. So here you can see this promotional film and for anyone who's really interested there is you can see this film on the Imperial War Museum's website and to the modern ear it is quite amusing. Um, it's, it's sort of a group of people, um, so I, I guess quite people with very posh high RP accents um, taking uh, factory workers around an art exhibition and sort of really telling them why they should appreciate art. Um, yeah, so this was like a precursor. So in these images here, you can see the person on the left and then the painting that we have in our collection on the right called The Breakwater by James Fitton. Um, and there were 76 paintings in all. And that, that sort of group of 76 paintings was what began as the, the first holdings of the Arts Council collection. So 
SEMA ran until 1946, and in 1946, uh, largely led by um, key figures such as John Maynard Keynes, the uh, sort of famous economist, um, the there was a deemed need to have an Arts Council, something that was more formal, something that would continue. And the Arts Council of Great Britain um, was ratified in 1946, um, and all the paintings that were part of that original group you can see on the Art UK website. However, our first exhibition wasn't about painting, even though that's what we had at that point. It was about sculpture. Um, so our first exhibition was called Sculpture in the Home, um, and it toured between 1946 and 1959 um, to a number of venues across the UK. So it was sort of like an annual uh, tour, um, and each year um, it sort of toured to between seven and 13 venues. So it, was, it really got out and about. It really was all over the UK. Um, the then director of Arts Council, uh, a, a gentleman called Philip James, said the exhibition is intended to show people that sculpture is just as homeworthy as paintings. So that tells you or tells us quite a bit about the attitude to different art forms at the time. And this is what the exhibition was like. Um, it was a little bit like, I guess, uh, today walking around like an IKEA set of rooms. There were all these sort of room installations with furniture and um, rugs, soft furnishing, things like that. And then there were a group of sculptures, small scale sculptures that were displayed in the um, in the sort of the setting um, with some mainly drawings, but some prints on the walls behind them, uh, giving this idea that this could be your room, that you could imagine that, encouraging people to either own artwork to purchase it from their local artist um, or to be artists themselves and to create their own their own works. Um, this exhibition um, was selected by a subcommittee of artists which include artists such as Frank Dobson and Henry Moore um, and that's really a key part of how Arts Council Collection um, that's really part of our ways of working, um, whether it is curating an exhibition or choose, choosing which works to acquire, artists have always been involved in direct decision making, which shapes and continues to shape the collection. Um, when I touch on some of our acquisitions process, how we purchase artwork and some of our uh, current programming uh, later on, you'll see how we continue to make sure artists are really key in shaping the collection. So the exhibition was comprised of a mix of established artists and earlier career talent um, and compared to some of the large open air exhibitions that um, we see in sort of the, uh, the 50s. Um, this uh, exhibition had a much higher proportion of women artists with around 50% of the um, original artist list um, being represented by women. So this is likely because the contemporary mindset um, and the sort of the idea behind this exhibition that this was about sculpture in the home. Um, there was a, an idea that women might be more adept to making small scale sculpture suitable for domestic um, settings, and that might be less something that a male artist would do. Perhaps not something we would sort of agree with at all, but um, it gives us an idea of some of the, the views, some of the historical prejudices that go into shaping collections. Um, and provide a context for why we have what we have today. Um, not all the works that were in this exhibition were acquired for the collection, actually only a small proportion were. Um, this was a model that was like a touring exhibition where artists were invited in to bring a group of works together, tour it around the country, some of which would, would stay with the collection and some of which would be returned to the, the artists. From around 1964 onwards, um, we've had uh, external representatives who are part of choosing what goes into the Arts Council collection. Um, and we have an acquisition process. It's a really exciting part of what we do. Um, and every year we are acquiring new artworks, uh, sometimes around sort of 35 to 40 artworks every year. And um, from our very early days, it's, it's always been artists um, who are in the earlier stages of their career. Um, and this, um, this is seen as sort of being a, a boost to the artist's career, but also in, at a time specifically when we were found, uh, founded where resources might be uh, shy, might be quite um, difficult to come by, to purchase existing artwork then helps an artist to go on to make their next artwork. Um, and although we have done some commissioning processes over the year, really uh, a large part of our model is around purchasing that existing artwork. 
So some of the earliest uh, people who were helped us purchase uh, artworks were the artists Adrian Stokes and Adrian Heath. Um, and again, that's something that's always continued um, throughout our history. We've always had at least one, two, sometimes more artists on our acquisitions panel who are making those choices for us. So these are people that are practicing artists and have that sort of level of appreciation, but also in artistic circles, um, which might be different from the more institutional circles that uh, other delegates might have been part of. And that panel changed every one to two years. In our early days, it changed every year. It was different people every year making these choices for us. Um, and now it's every two years. And in my belief, this is one of the strongest parts of Arts Council Collections history, um, is it's not the same people making those decisions year in, year out, but it's different perspectives uh, coming to the collection, different circles and different influences. And I think that's what made the collection this kind of quite adapt, quite changing um, element each year. So the collection continued to grow and grow and now we have just over 8,000 artworks um, and we make them work hard. They really are always out and about um, depending on how sort of the stats are falling each year and obviously we've had two very unusual years. Um, we're one of the most prolific lenders of contemporary and modern British art, um, any, well, pre-pandemic. Um, each year we were roughly lending around 1100 to 1200 works every year um, because that's our bread and butter, that's what we do. We're here to get our artworks out and about, to work with people and so people can see and experience the collection. So for this talk, I was asked to select five artworks or roughly five artworks to talk about. Um, and there are numerous artworks in the collection with really interesting stories behind them, um, which I'd love to tell you tons of stories about different artworks. I mean, I could talk about our Head Six by Francis Bacon, probably a painting that we're really well known for, um, as that was his first painting of the, of the Pope series, it references Velasquez's masterpiece. Um, we have a really interesting story about our David Hockney painting, We Two Boys Together Clinging. Um, we originally purchased a different painting um, from Hockney's RA uh, sorry, from Hockney's uh, RCA uh, exhibition, his Royal College of Art exhibition. Um, but so legend goes that uh, the artist uh, came down to Arts Council of Great Britain offices uh, a few weeks later and said, that's not the painting you want, you want this one. And we swapped it. Not something we often do. But I feel these stories were new, were known and they were out there. So I wanted to tell sort of a different story and to pick five artworks that might not be readily or often talked about from the collection. Some of them are definitely, some you some you will recognise. Um, and I lead a research network called the Working Class British Art Network. And something that I've been really interested in developing is almost like a working class history of Arts Council collection. Um, and that's not you know, fully what this is, um, but I wanted to start to tell that narrative. And so I chose some artists that I felt uh, their stories and the stories behind them chimed with the history of Arts Council collection. Um, as from Arts Council collection's origins, we were always supposed to be out and about and to be there for people who have less regular access to art and to support those artists who are early on in their careers um, where being part of a, a collection like ours would provide a boost. Um, so the works I've chosen, um, so actually well, let's start with this artwork. So the first painting I've chosen is called Siesta by Ruskin Spear. Um, and this was one of those original 76 paintings that we had in our collection. Um, and it is a domestic scene, as you can see. So it shows the artist's um, wife um, at home, um, the fabrics of their clothing sort of melding into the fabrics of the scene that you can see there. Um, and it's a very sort of domestic, soft, sort of intimate scene. Um, and in the 1950s, um, Ruskin Spear was among the artists deemed the best of British and Engli English painting. Um, and he painted the places and people he knew best and the places he felt most familiar being the pubs, the streets and the people of working class Hammersmith. Um, so his depictions of the, the bright lights, the, the red London buses, the shining wet streets of, of London have often been cited as influencing uh, sort of the pop art movement. Um, and he was an exclusively an urban artist. Um, he wasn't interested in the sort of near romanticism at the time or abstraction. Um, he didn't go for painting sort of grand buildings or those sort of, you know, 
majestic views of the Thames, um, but he firmly placed his work in the company of working class London. Um, and we have a, another work in our collection by him, which is perhaps more typical of his style, this uh, woman in red jumper from 1948, um, which was entered into the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy. Um, again, not a painting of the great and the good, as you might see at the Royal Academy, um, but a, a warm, approachable, deeply human um, painting, somebody that you feel that you might have known or you might have seen somewhere that you might want to talk to or might be you know, a familiar figure in the community. Um, and that's so probably more typical of his portrait painting. This is actually less typical. There are some um, uh, domestic scenes in his practice, but this is one of those works which is almost like a little bit of a surprise in his um, in his practice um, and something that I thought was a, a really interesting beginning for the, the collection as you know as I talked about the, our first show was about sculpture in the home that this is one of our first paintings showing that there's kind of the inspiration of being in the home the artistry of being in the home and uh, looking around your immediate um, surroundings probably isn't a surprise when um, during this you know the period when this would have been acquired in 19 well sort of we probably acquired it in 1938-1939 and then as it toured in those early early times the rebuilding of homes the um, getting back to the core values of sort of family life was a, a big part of British culture at that time. The next artist I'm going to touch on is uh, an artist that I'm sure will be familiar to many many people um, often when you talk about working class British art people will then say and Lowry what about L.S. Lowry um, so we're really fortunate to have eight works by uh, Ellis Lowry in the collection and um, the Arts Council collection often purchases just one or two artworks by uh, an artist. Sometimes we have those groups or bodies of works, um, but we're not generally here to sort of uh, amass sort of big monographic um, collections of artists work. We often have those few examples and move on to other artists and other artists. So this work is, as you can see, a, a seaside scene. It's July uh, 1943. Um, and although this is not one of Lowry's typical mill scenes, those factory scenes that he's very well known for, um, there's a definite familiarity here with the figures that we can see. Um, so even though this is July, um, there's that, that element of comedy there, as you can see uh, people in the scene with a big, big coats on, with big hats on, we've got some sort of younger children with shorts and t-shirt, but there are sort of the those in a slightly more formal attire for the the forties, um, when I guess actually things would be much more uh, demure maybe at the seaside. Um, there's a few figures that often catch my eye on here. The idea of pushing these prams that you can see against the sand seems like a bit of a, a fruitless task, but uh, but there we go. So we've got this bold, lively um, scene at the seaside. It makes you think of picnics, paddling, sandcastles, family. For me, it makes, definitely makes me think of my dad saying, you will stay here and finish your sandwiches, even if it is cold and windy. Um, so it's not without its trademark absurdities, um, but it is, you know, a scene that you feel is quite familiar for Lowry. Also in the collection, we have this comedic scene of a, a woman in a red hat clinging to the back of uh, this tractor uh, from 1961, so a few years later. Um, and in telling the history of Arts Council collection, this, this um, work was given by a notable figure in our history, or more specifically Arts Council England's history, that of Sir William Emery's, uh, Bill Emery's, who was editor-in-chief of Penguin Butts and a real powerhouse educationalist, and really one of those driving forces behind bringing the Arts Council um, of Great Britain, Arts Council England, into fruition. Like Lowry, he was born in Manchester um, and he was really passionate about adult education. Uh, he was the founder of a scheme called Arts, Arts for the People, which aimed to bring art to working class communities and towns and those places which were galleryless. Um, and Arts, Arts for the People uh, sort of was one of those things that combined with SEMA as those early precursors to then bring about Arts Council of Great Britain and, uh, and the Associate Collection. But the work I specifically wanted to focus on here is um, this seascape. Um, so this is perhaps a work that is less familiar um, when you think about um, Lowry's work. Uh, Lowry said the battle of life, the turbulence of the sea. 
Um, I've been fond of the sea all my life, how wonderful it is, how terrible it is. It's all there. It's all there in the sea. The battle for life is there and fate and the inevitability of it all. It's obviously not doesn't have his trademark figures. There isn't that sort of sense of humour there. But um, I feel like with all of Larry's work beneath that humour, that comedic, there's always that fine line of melancholy, perhaps loneliness, um, which is much more heightened in work such as this, where the only compositional element we have here is that divide, that very fine, faint divide on the horizon. And this is a painting that you really do need to see um, in the flesh to really see those links between uh, Larry's artwork because it is the quality of the paint, the way that it's applied, that kind of roughness to it, um, that when you look closely at it, it just feels so quintessentially Lowry, even though the subject matter isn't. What really started my interest with Arts Council Collection and thinking about um, working class identities was very much this painting here, uh, sorry, not painting, this uh, photographic series here um, by an artist called Joe Spence. It's called Beyond the Family Album from 1979 and like Lowry, um, <laughs> Jo Spence does really like to embrace a sense of humour in her work. Um, Beyond the Family Album is a, a series of panels which were displayed and um, they were originally displayed in community centres, specifically women's community centres, um, and it was about highlighting the unseen work um, that often goes into making family life run smoothly. So it's what's behind that family album, because for Joe Spence, the family album was often, um, you know, those, you know, we often all have the same pictures. We all have a first birthday, a second birthday, a third birthday, the pictures where people are smiling. But what isn't perhaps photographed is perhaps those moments of exhaustion, um, those moments of uh, perhaps, you know, sadness, of grief, of things like that. So in a uh, you know, initially, this is the first uh, um, image in the in the work. There is a sense of humour. So she's got that quintessential baby, naked baby photograph um, that many people might have. And then she's recreated it herself. And what was really important to her was to keep her glasses on because um, uh, Jo Spence started her career in a um, advertising a photographic studio and she became very disillusioned by how advertising image imagery was so narrow that things like photographing somebody with glasses with such a um what was seen as such as an imperfection as just wearing a pair of glasses just wasn't done and so she's often photographed in that way I just wanted to give you another example. This isn't in our collection, but this is actually the background to my computer because it always makes me smile. Uh, this is in the Joe Spence Memorial Archive uh, housed in Toronto, and it's called Calling Card. And I hope you can see this on your screen, but it's a little business card that Joe uh, um, produced. And it says available for divorces, funerals, illnesses, social injustice, scenes of domestic violence, explorations of sexuality, and any joyful events. Um, because what she's really interested in doing is capturing those things that are behind those picture perfect moments. I've, I've gone off, off track now and <laughs> I'm just going to get back to my notes. Um, yeah, so Jo Spence uh, was born in Essex to a working class family. Um, her parents were factory workers and they you know, aspirational at the time, wanted more for their daughter and sent her to secretarial college, where she ended up as a secretary in a photo photographer's studio. Um, she's really well known for her documentation of her illness, um, and those might be the images that uh, people know of her most readily. Um, but the work that we have in our collection is one of those early works, those landmark work. It's actually made for the Haywood, an exhibition at Haywood Art Gallery just across the way here. Um, and it's one of those works that's often revisited, although maybe overshadowed by that later very raw work around her illness. And then I wanted to move on to another work, which um, by Tracy Emin, uh, one of the sort of uh, famed uh, RBA group of artists, which again might not be a work that the, uh, the artist is known for, but very, very early in her career. Um, so for those that uh, uh, aren't familiar with the, the young British artists of the 1980s, um, these were a group of artists. Uh, around circles such as Damien Hirst, Tracy Emin, um, who um, were known as being very bold, very brash, um, very confrontational in their artwork and really sort of changed and shaped a, a sort of a decade of, and plus of art. 
um, and Tracy Emin was key in that group. This is actually a video work and I wish I could show you the video, but unfortunately that's definitely a technological advance that is beyond me. Um, but uh, this is a, a short video um, which uh, is called Why I Never Became a Dancer and it's autobiographical as many of Emin's works are and it recalls her teenage bid to leave the seaside town of Margate uh, where she'd grown up. So it starts with panning shots of, of the town overlaid with the voice of the artist narrating her story and then the video builds this climax of her wanting to escape Margate to have a new life to move to London by um, competing in a local disco dancing competition in the aim to get into the British Disco Dance Championship in 1978 and she says as I start to dance people started to clap I was going to win and then I was out of here nothing could stop me and then they started slag 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 so she was humili humiliated by a group of local boys most of whom she uh, confesses to have slept with and loses the competition but the video concludes with her uh, in a, a studio twirling around in a large empty room to that song by Sylvester, You Make Me Feel, um, accompanied by her voiceover where she says, Shane, Eddie, Tony, Doug, Richard, this one's for you. And she's reclaiming that moment that was sort of very pivotal in holding her back in her early years. Um, this work by Ingrid Pollard, um, again, a work that was purchased really early in the career. So the Emin work was, I believe, that her first video work um, made in 1995 prior to her uh, Turner Prize uh, nomination in 1999. And this work by um, Ingrid Pollard, again, an early part in the career. Uh, Ingrid is um, a guy uh, uh, from Guyana and now lives in Britain. Um, and this series called Pastoral Interlude is a series of photographs created in 1987, delicately toned and tinted photographs which reflect on the artist's experience of being a black woman in the English countryside. Um, they've got a sort of each of the photographs has this um, sort of beautifully soft image. Often the figure in the photograph is taking um, a part of sort of a uh, fishing or something that you would typically or rambling something you typically do in the countryside and it's contrasted with this very strong um, line beneath it the first one of which says it's as if the black experience is only ever lived within an urban environment I thought I liked the Lake District where I wandered lonely as a black face in a sea of white a visit to the countryside is always accompanied by a feeling of an ease of dread so this contrasts with this idea of the green and pleasant land uh, so often used to describe England um, and how unpleasant it is to feel so deeply unwelcome, so solitary in this environment. And really contrast with this idea that England is this kind of countryside idyll, that there isn't these other layers beneath, beneath this kind of very picturesque landscape. So I know I've run out of time here, so I'm going to very quickly sort of touch on the last artwork that I wanted to mention today before we move to questions. Um, this is by Sean Edwards and it's called Mailfer. Um, and in 2009, Sean undertook a residency in the Mailfer Shopping Centre in Clandon. Now, I'm really sorry if anybody on this is Welsh and is going to tell me that I pronounced that incorrectly, although I've got a very Welsh name. I pronunciation is not so great. Uh, it's on the outskirts of Cardiff and it's close to where he grew up. Um, so this is a shopping centre built in the 1970s. It's an aspirational sort of building project um, and it's around a high rise block of flats. And at the time that um, Sean makes this film, the building is still functional. People are using it day in, day out for their day to day lives. Um, but it's due for demolition. Um, and you know, this is one of those kind of more, uh, those projects that might be associated with gentrification, where even though the building is being used, it's not pretty, it's not um, seen, you know, something is seen to be there that is not um, going to attract more people to the to the area. So it's, it was now, it was subject to this multi-million pound regeneration scheme. So Sean did a, a residency in the centre and made a series of work. And this you know again it's a video work so I can't show you here today but this is a, a very soft sort of um, beautiful panning um, uh, uh, film that has it saturated with these colours um, which really highlights the kind of day, the beauty in this kind of day-to-day -day scenario and how this is part of our history it's part of you know recent history that is uh, being removed as well 
Um, so it's meditative and sombre, but it reflects on both the dis dis disappearance of vibrant communities and these failed utopian aspirations. Um, and this is one of our more recent acquisitions. I mean, we're, we're continuing to collect um, every year and each year we, it brings new narratives, new artists to the collection, um, which is sort of a really exciting part of the, the process. But thank you so much for joining me. Um, I hope you're able to see more from Arts Council Collection soon. Thank you.